Bibles in hand, let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4. And our verses of examination today will be from verse 15 to 31. As we survey these verses together, a sermon that I have entitled, No Graven Idols. No Graven Idols. The word, of the, Lord, the word of the Lord says, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horab out of the midst of the fire. Beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male, female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, and the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of the fish that is in the water or under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be a people of His own inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me because of you and He swore that I should not cross the Jordan and I should not enter the good land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan, but you shall go over and, and will take possession of that good land. Take care, lest you forget the covenant the Lord your God had made with you and make a carved image the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When your father's children, the children's children, have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing so evil in the sight of the Lord as to provoke him to anger, I will call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. And you will not live in it long, but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you amongst the peoples and you will be left few in number amongst the nations where the Lord will drive you and there you will serve the gods of wood and stone and the work of human hands that neither see, hear, eat, nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find Him if you search after Him with all of your heart and with all of your soul when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days. You will return to the Lord your God and obey His voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Now, in these 31 verses here, I will, in just a few moments, begin to mark out some things that are uh, idol worship. Last, ye last week, if you remember, there was a villain that I had shed some light on. A villain that I shed light on as a villain of the health and life of the church itself. And this villain is part of a multi-headed beast and one that is the head of this monster that is called individualism. And I introduced or shed some light on this idea, this toxic idea of individualism. And this villain is wreaking havoc upon the local church with an attempt to undermine Scripture, undermining the gospel, and undermine community. And you might say to yourself, what is this individualism that you speak of? And if you were with us last week, the flavor of this individualism comes in a way of referring to this particular beast, a villain, if you will, by saying something to the effect of, by what or whose authority can you dictate to me what to do or what not to do. In other words, who gives you the right to correct me? As a preacher, as a pastor, who gives you the right to correct me? As a deacon or an elder, who gives you the right to correct me? Again, the authority for correction does not lie in the one administering said correction, but in the power and authority of the Word of God. Another beast 
Another head on this beast that I want to remind you of this day, as you have probably already implied or have already figured out, is just as scary as the toxic idea of individualism. It is just as scary and has many more teeth. This villain will grab a hold of you with its many teeth and will do much damage, more damage, in fact, than you ever thought would be possible. It will lead you away from devotion. It will lead you away from worship and adoration to Jesus and it will distract you with its many teeth. It will distract you from truth. And the head is that of idolatry. And there are many teeth in this head. Many idols that we have erected in our lives, in the lives of believers and in the life of the local church. And by the way, ministry can become an idol. The point where ministry becomes an idol is if we leave out the core of the gospel. If we leave out that there is only one name under heaven in which men might be saved, and that is through the name of Jesus Christ. When we begin to focus on the logistics of the ministry and leave out the gospel, we have strayed into the land of idolatry. So if you'll permit me for just a few minutes, I would like to shed some light on some of these idols. And by no means will I be able to catalog and sometimes we teeter on the verge of, of legalism. But what I want to do is just bring out a few idols that, we might, that might have to do with the health and vitality of the church. Now, Moses is meeting here on the mountain, continuing to, to further teach this generation. And it is with great power and authority, not the authority in Moses. It is the power and authority of God Almighty that Moses gives further instruction to the people at Mount Horeb. When you go into the promised land, you are to listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. Why? Because they are good for you. You, you live in these statutes and commands that you may live and go and take possession of the land that God has promised to give you and your Fathers, hold fast to him, and he will hold fast to you. In fact, I like to think of it this way. Hold fast to him, and he will hold faster to you. You pursue him, and guess what? He will pursue you more. Follow God in his commands so close and clean as to show our love for him and then demonstrate it to the world a world that says what great nation is there that has a God that is so near to it as to the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him and by the way this is on the other side of the cross this is on the other side of the Holy Spirit and dwelling in his church and today we can emphatically say whenever we call upon the name of the Lord as believers guess what he's there isn't he Oh, what great importance it is to pass on what we, have, what we know to our children. We saw a beautiful demonstration of that this morning and their children's children and how the gospel will transform lives. I believe that the, that the gospel, the good news, changes people's lives. I have seen it transform people's lives. And I'm a testament to a transformed life. And many other, others in here are as well. See, we, we keep trying to keep our children entertained. Our children don't need entertainment. They need the core of God's Word. We don't need to sing and dance and have our children in every, all, every activity that we can get them in to keep them entertained. They need God's Word. And so we, we, get, we have them involved in all types of other things as if those things are going to teach them how to live and thrive in community when the gospel teaches that there is something better, there is a better teacher for community and living in prosperity with the, with the Lord God and others around us. There's something better than having activities and entertainment. It is the word of God. It is the gospel of Jesus. And it is the duty of every person who names the name of Christ to become familiar with the scriptures, and then to educate the youth. So, bear with me. With verse 15, there's a few things that we do with our idols. Number one, we are to lay down our idols and be conformed. What does that mean? So we think of conformed as some stringent, strict thing. But to be, think of it like this, lay down your idols and be fitted. Now what does that mean? Bear with me and we will talk about what it means to be conformed. 
Verse 15, Therefore watch yourself carefully. You saw there was no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you out of Horeb in the midst of fire. Now something similar was said at the end of John 5 and 21. First John 5, 21 says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Keep yourself from idols. And the reason that this admonition is so repeated in Scripture is because we are so apt to set them up. I am reminded of, of the old, an old Western scene. Now, I grew up, my uncles used to watch Westerns, and I would come in black and white, technicolor, whatever they might be, and I would walk in, and it was always a showdown in, in their living room. Always two gunslingers walking out at noon and, and, and getting ready to... to, to to gunsling on each other, and, and, and we're going to draw on each other. And this is how quick we are to set up something that, is, that has a potential of becoming idolatrous to us. So we get the picture of this quick draw McGraw when it, when it comes to idolatry. And so, and so here's the thing. God cannot be accurately represented in a piece of wood. He can't be accurately represented in a cross or a painting or a piece of steel, or anything that is to be carved to represent Him. There's nothing that will adequately represent the Lord our God. And so there is a prohibition. Do away with all these idols, because nothing will take the place or represent accurately the living God. And so, those who worship Him must worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. And the fact is, no matter what fashion out of our hands, out of wood or steel, they will never represent God Almighty mighty sufficiently enough to fully represent God's holiness. And so we spend most of our lives as child of God, of children of God through Christ, fashioning idols along the way. And we erect idols in our lives, and these are things that take away from our worship to King Jesus. John Calvin once said this, a very popular or well-known uh, quote. He said, the heart is an idol factory. And what he means is that is that we continually produce idols because we are good at making just about anything into an idol. Moses gives this warning. He says, Beware, lest you act corruptly, and you make a carved image for yourself in the form of any likeness, whether it be male, female, animal, anything on earth, winged animals, anything that creeps on the earth, a, a winged creatures, things in the water. If you look up to the sky... Uh, you, you might see the, the illuminaries, the sun, the moon, the, 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 the stars, and, and, you, and you might fashion something in, in their likeness and bow down to them and serve them. The things that God has, uh, has given to you, but you don't bow down to those things. See, humankind has, been, has a scarred history of making idols out of the created order. There are idols dedicated to the gods. You go back all the way to Egypt. Go back past Egypt. Human history has, has gods dedicated to the moon, the stars, gods of the rivers, streams, etc. And Romans gives a, a warning against anyone who worships the creation over the creator, Romans 1.25. Before Moses reminds them of their flight from Egypt, he reminds them that that culture that they left had fashioned idols almost out of anything. They had idols of beasts, oxen, heifers, sheep, goat, lion, dog, monkeys, birds, crane, hawk, and the reptiles, crocodiles, serpents, frogs, flies, beetles, and the fish of the Nile, the Nile itself, the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, the fire, the light, the air, the darkness, the night, the internet, <laughs> pornography, cellular phones, Sports, whatever it might be. History is replete with arachnid idols and the many teeth that are sinking its teeth into the life and health of the church. And after all the Lord has done, after saving us by His mighty hand, by giving us salvation in Jesus Christ alone, we are still chasing the things in our life that are lifeless and are meaningless in the grand scheme of things. Don't you remember that the Lord has taken you out of Egypt, out of the iron furnace, to be a people of His own inheritance as you are this day? Don't you remember how the Lord saved you? Do you remember when Jesus Christ saved you? 
Do you remember how the Lord saved you and set you apart for His glory? And we can't even give Him an hour on Sunday morning to worship Him. We think if we come to church on, for Sunday school and Sunday service that we have done a service to the Lord. And I really don't understand why we call this a church service. What service are we doing to King Jesus by being here this morning? Now our service is out there. Our service is making the name of Jesus known to a lost and dying world. And somehow we have reconstructed, we have reconstrued what service means as if sitting in a pew is our service to Jesus. Now, what is keeping your heart and mind from meditating upon the Lord Jesus continually? The Lord saved you, but why did He save you? He saved you for a purpose, but he ultimately saved you by his good, sovereign will. He didn't save you because you are an upright, model citizen. He didn't look down the ages and say, well, that Larry Stevens, he's a pillar in the community. Or he's going to be. Let me save him. He didn't save you because he knew that you were going to be a doctor or that you were going to be a lawyer or knew that you were going to be a scientist or a chemist or whatever it might be. No, he didn't save you. He didn't save you because... Because of that, he saved, he saved us to serve him and, 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 to, and to worship him. And get this, to worship him forever, forever. Idols prohibit and hinder this worship. See, Tim Keller was once asked to define an idol. And he said this. He said, as he is asked the question, what is an idol? He said, is it, it is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart, now take a note of these things. Anything that absorbs your heart, your imagination more than God. Anything you seek, anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. An idol is whatever you look to and say, listen, in your heart, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know that I have value. And then I'll feel significant and secure. People, there is no more security than there is in Jesus Christ. CEDE Sports had wrote an article that used Tim Keller's quote. And this was on the dangers of idolatry in sports. As far as the article goes, you can insert anything there. Anything that is attempting or has attempted to replace worship and adoration to King Jesus with something else. I want you to listen to what this article had to say. It asked the question, how do I know when sports has become an idol? And based on what I just read from Tim Keller, that quote, an idol absorbs my heart, it gives me significance, etc. I want you to listen to this comparison. When has sports become an idol? When sports, or anything that you can add there, absorbs my heart, it absorbs my imagination, it gives my life meaning, or would sports would give me value, or sports would make me feel significant. And by the way, this isn't, this isn't an attack on sports. My boys are in sports. I was in sports. I grew up with it. So it's not an attack on there. You can put anything, anything in those slots. But I want you to hear me out. If I am to teach my children to love Jesus and to know Him well, then I am happier for their relationship with Jesus more than I am if they hit a little ball around and run some bases or make the team. Nothing against sports or fishing or any hobby that you might have. This isn't a charge against those things. It is where is it at in your life? Now, I believe that the Lord Jesus wants us to live out our faith. And whatever we do, we do it well and do it for the glory of God. So it may be sports, it may be a hobby, it may be whatever. But whatever we do, do it for the glory of God and the worship of King Jesus. The question is, where is it in your relationship? Where is it at in your life? Is Christ supreme and preeminent in your life? Moses gathers the people and he gets real with them. Now, you might... 
You might say, well, pastor, that, that seemed to be you you're getting real there. And, and the fact of it is, it's not just me getting real because it hits home with me too. He gathers the people in for this third time saying, well, the Lord was angry with me because of you. He swore that I could almost hear the, the little bit of sarcasm here. So, in, in fact, I, would, I have emphasized on the word you as I read through here. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me because of you. And he swore that I should not cross the Jordan and that I should not enter the good land that the Lord, your God, is given you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land and must not go over the Jordan. But you shall go over and take possession of the good land. So Moses is saying, I know I messed up. Some of the greatest lessons in life, parents, is to teach when you mess up. To be transparent when you mess up. And when you make a mistake, that's, that's part of teaching this upcoming generation. You don't follow this path, but follow this. Take care, at least you forget the covenant. Don't forget the word of God. Don't forget, don't, don't chase after idols. Don't make carved images. The Lord has forbidden you to do so. Why? Because the Lord God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. He wants our adoration or none. It is either, you're either all in for Jesus or not at all. God is a consuming fire, the Bible says, and He has brought His people out of the trying fires of Egypt to mold them, to shape them, to remind them, to remove any dross that might have surfaced and to be part of His kingdom. And a part of this wilderness experience is to mold them and shape them to remove dross and sin. And He wants to shape you too. You might say, well, preacher, this side of the cross... As these covenants and these commands were for Israel, how are we today shaped in the image of God Almighty? And we are shaped in the image of God Almighty by God the Son. And you might say, how might we be shaped or to what end? And Romans chapter 8, 29, a well-known verse in all of God's Word says this, For those who He foreknew, He also predestined to be what? To be conformed or fitted to the image of the Son, in order that He might be the firstborn amongst many brothers. It's almost as, as if God wants us to be tailored in Jesus. I want to be tailored in Jesus. Now, I can probably think of one time in all of my life that I have went to get fitted for a suit. But they actually did some measurements. And I come out with, you know, with, with a couple suits. And I can remember one time in my life being fitted. And that's the idea. I want to forever be tailored in the person of Jesus. I want to be conformed to His image. I, I, want, I, want, to be, I want to be tailored to the fact where I look like Jesus. To be conformed. To lay down our idols and be conformed to King Jesus. And then we are to lay our idols down and pick up the cross. And by the way, you can't pick up your cross if you've got a handful of idols. Amen. When you and your father's children and your children's children have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly, you make a carved image in form of anything, and you do this as evil in my sight, you've provoked God to anger. And by the way, I will call heaven and earth to witness against you, that you will utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but you will be utterly destroyed. Now, now's the time to, to take responsibility for your own faith. And by the way, I can't, I, I, you know, I can't save my boys. I can't save my family. I can teach them the word and lead them and guide them. I, I, I can lead them to hear, but that relationship is between them and the Lord Jesus. But there is some responsibility that I have as a parent there is some responsibility that I have as a leader of my home to make sure I'm leading them to hear, to, to absorb God's Word. We prayed at the altar last week for our youth and for our students in this church. We bore our, our burdens and were transparent to the Lord and one another as we gathered on this altar. And it's, it's something that I think we continually need to do every day of our life because our youth they are facing a lot of things in the world that sometimes we don't even know about. And it's our responsibility to answer for our own faith and, and to lead in such a way that is Christ honoring and pointing to Jesus. And I can't do that if I got idols in my life. 
things that are cluttering up my life. We are to devote ourselves to the service of God. But I've got to tell you, reading through the book of Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus, the Torah, I am thankful for the role of the Holy Spirit in my life. I am thankful that when I sin, and let me ask you this, do you sin? Yes, you do. When I sin, I know the Holy Spirit will convict me of that sin and I can't get too far down the road without yielding. Now, that's not boasting in Larry Stevens. That is boasting in the power of God. That I can't get too far away from my Lord before he calls me back to himself. I can't get too far without yielding. In fact, John 16 verse 8 says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit will let you know if you're in sin. Now in Israel's history, we see that their children and their children's children will in fact carve idols, images of other gods and idols. And if you want a good telling of this, read the book of Kings, Judges, Isaiah, Jeremiah. In fact, read anywhere in the Bible and you'll see how fast we are distracted to drift from the Lord. And I always think of that song, Come Thou Fount, that says we are prone to wonder. We are prone to wonder from our Lord. If you follow idols, you will perish. If you follow the Lord, you will prosper. Now, the main reason that Israel went into exile was due to the fact of their idolatry and chasing other idols. We find this in Isaiah. We find it in Jeremiah. We find it in the Minor Prophets, that they were chasing after other gods and other idols. In fact, Isaiah prophesied, saying in chapter 1, verse 21, How the faithful city has become a whore. She was full of justice. That's powerful language, isn't it? This once faithful city has become like an unfaithful wife or an unfaithful spouse. She was once full of justice, once now full of righteousness, but now it is a city full of murderers because it has chased other gods. And this is strong language, that Israel will commit adultery, spiritual adultery against the Lord. And what will be the price of that idolatry? The Lord says He will scatter the people, and you will be left in numbers amongst the nations, and you will be driven there, and you will serve the gods of stone, Wood, things that don't eat, don't hear, don't smell. And there was a time in Israel's history when they, when, when they would have rather starved or froze to death than to put that wooden idol in the fire to cook them some food or to keep warm. We would rather die than give up something. We would rather die than give up something that, that is costly to serve Jesus. We, we, we would rather die than to give up that time sitting in the recliner watching TV or, or anything that comes against worshiping and serving the Lord. He says, but from there you will seek the Lord. I like that, that conjunction. I always call those good news conjunctions, gospel conjunctions. But from there you will seek the Lord your God. And guess what? You'll find him. If you search after him with, here's the key, all of your heart, with all of your soul, when you are in tribulation and all these things come against you in the latter day, you will return to the Lord, your God, and obey His voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that He swore to them. Now, as I'm reading this, your mind is going to the words of Jesus in the Great Commission. I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? In short, those who are truly children of God, when they sin and they chase after idols, will return to the Lord. I believe there will be a time that those chasing idols have idols in their life. Maybe, maybe right now you know somebody might be straying from the Lord, but if they are in the Lord, the Lord will call them back to Himself. If they are in Christ. The same can be said for a true follower of the Lord Jesus. He will call them back to Himself and they will by the leadership and power of the Holy Spirit, cast those idols down. Those who have confessed their sins and have repented and have put their faith in the saving work of Jesus will return to His goodness. The last portion of this last verse that I just read says this, The Lord your God is merciful. And you know what? He still is. He still is. 
The Lord Jesus told his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And some, that might mean that they would serve Jesus unto death. Others mean it would, they would plant churches across the world. Another, they would, might suffer persecution. But whatever it might be, as we take up our cross and follow the Lord, we will, we will never follow Jesus with our hands full of idols. We will never see the kingdom grow with idols littered, littered on our horizon. God is merciful, but he has also left us imperatives and commands. And now, one might be saying, these commands were for Israel. These commandments were just for Israel. Yes, to be a light to the nations, to lead people to know that there is one true God. But I, as I read that verse last week from 1 John chapter 5, I, rem, I am reminded that this imperative and command is still intact that says, keep yourself from idols. And by the way, this message is so much, so much uh, of importance for you and I today that the word idolatry is mentioned 116 times in the Word of God. Simply by searching out the word idols, you will find 116 times. And, and if it is 116 times, most of the time is it in the context of casting down your idols and trampling idols underfoot. In fact, the word idolatry, the act, this act of of idol worship is six times and over and again the command is to trample idols underfoot and to tear them down from their exalted altars. And I've got to say in closing, God means business. Anything that is keeping you from full adoration to King Jesus is an idol. And I have learned this lesson a hard way. I have learnt the lesson, if you don't tear them down, if you don't cast them down, if you do not give them up, He will. And when He tears down idols, it is much more painful. It was once said that trusting people, possession, or positions to do for me what only God can do is idolatry. And I hope that we are all mature in here today. Mature enough in here today to be able to handle the words that I have expounded, these words of admonition for us all. They don't just cut off here at the pulpit because the pastor is bringing them. These are words of admonition, uh, ad, admonition from the pulpit to the street. So what need is there for me to try to catalog the many idols that may litter mine in your lives? I will tell you this. Having idols in your life is also deceitful. It will have you saying, listen, oh, it's not standing in the way of the Lord. You'll start right now. Oh, I can give that up at any time. It's not standing in the way of my adoration to King Jesus, and it may or may not. But I have heard that same language from people who are addicted to whatever it might be, drugs, alcohol, or whatever it might be. Oh, it's not standing in the way of the Lord. And oh, how we have fallen for the wiles of the devil. And deep down, you know that you need to cast it to Jesus and to follow him. And we don't face a cabinet of gods. We don't face false gods in our lives, you know, because they don't exist. We don't face them like Israel did. We face pressures from a different pantheon. We face, we face uh, uh, materialism. The accumulation of all we can get, the love of money, the love of leisure, the love of sexuality or sensuality, the worship of, of self, security. We want to make sure that we are secure and we'll do everything we can in this life to make sure that we have this secure security when Jesus himself said, you will suffer persecution. I don't want to go on a mission trip. It's hostile there. And yet, Jesus has said to go. Now the second commandment deals with idols. What is the object of our affection? What is the object of our efforts? What is the object of our attention? Where does the majority of our time go? 
On what do we spend the greatest amount of our resources? Answer those questions and we will be able to mark those idols in our life. Like I said, I'm not going to catalog them for you. You know if something is standing in the way of you truly serving the Lord Jesus. Only you can answer that. But there is a command that is through all the scriptures, not just in the old, to cast our idols and pick up our cross and follow King Jesus. Do you believe that? Amen. Let's pray.